Israeli attacks on Gaza escalate after three Israelis are killed in a rocket attack. How will the new Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt react to Israel's first major acts of aggression since the Arab Spring? Well, hello and welcome to this specially extended edition of The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. We'll be discussing the increasingly serious situation in Gaza in about 25 minutes in the second segment of this specially extended edition to keep you up to date with events in the Palestinian territories. In part three, in just under an hour, we'll be asking whether sanctions against Iran are worth the deaths of possibly millions of Iranians. Well, that's the number of lives at risk, according to the country's top medical charity. The sanctions prevent the importing of medicines and hospital equipment. Well, we start today in another desperate part of the Middle East, Syria. It's been an eventful week, and while it is certainly not the end, could this week mark the beginning of the end of 20 months of bloodletting? Rebels ended a military stalemate in the north, taking control of several key towns. And the move reflects a clear erosion of the regime's strategic position in northern Syria. And in Qatar, a de facto government in exile was formed, calling itself the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces. Well, unlike other groups, the National Coalition was formed at the request and with the supervision of Western nations and Gulf Cooperation Council states. An opportunity for Syria's fragmented op op opposition to unite at last? Or is this little more than an attempt by the West and its royal allies in the Middle East to create a compliant government in Syria? Well, before we discuss these matters, here's Emily Churchill. It's hoped that this could be the beginning of a unified, viable opposition to President Bashar al-Assad's regime. After several days of fraught negotiations, the disparate Syrian opposition groups gathered here in Doha emerged with a result. The Syrian National Coalition for Opposition and Revolutionary Forces, a new umbrella group which brings together the Syrian National Council and other members of the opposition. At its head, Muaz al-Khatib, a cleric who used to be the imam at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. The deal also comes just days after George Sabra, a left-wing Christian, was elected as leader of the Syrian National Council. Supporters hope this broad coalition will help to bring an end to the bloody conflict in Syria, which activists say has cost 39,000 lives since the uprising began 20 months ago. But some opposition members have criticised the coalition for failing to represent all groups and for the prominent role foreign powers have played in the process. So far, the only European country to give the coalition full recognition is France, which, significantly, also said it would look again at arming the opposition if the coalition reached the point of forming a transitional government. J'annonce ici que la France reconnaît la coalition nationale syrienne comme la seule représentante du peuple syrien et donc comme le futur gouvernement provisoire de la Syrie démocratique permettant d'en terminer avec le régime de Bachar el-Assad. France was joined by the Gulf states in recognizing the Syrian national initiative as the sole legitimate representative of its people. Other European countries, the USA and the Arab League, welcomed the coalition, but stopped short of giving it full recognition. We consider them a legitimate uh, representative of the aspirations of uh, the Syrian people. Uh, we're not yet prepared to recognize them as some sort of government in exile, but we do think that it is a broad-based representative group. The Syrian government has dismissed the initiative, saying it is nothing more than a rehashing of previous plans. Emily Churchill, Islam Channel. Thanks, Emily, for that report. Well, I'm very pleased to have in the studio Dr. Rebwa Fatah, the director of the Middle East Consultancy Services Group, we also have the journalist and political analyst Dan Glazebrook. And on the phone from Doha, we have Yasser Tabara, a spokesperson for the coalition. And from Turkey, we have Loué Mokdad, a spokesman for the Free Syrian Army. Well, Yasser Tabara, uh, in Doha, if we could uh, speak to you fresh from the talks there, um, what's changed? I mean, why are groups that couldn't agree for over 18 months um, suddenly united? Well, uh, 20 months into this uh, revolution, uh, over 45,000 uh, people dead uh, on the hands of the 
Bashar al-Assad criminal regime, uh, the use of uh, air force bombardments uh, on innocent civilians with densely populated areas. Um, all of these were factors uh, that uh, pushed the urgency of uh, coming together and uh, moving forward. This, however, was not an effort that just sprung overnight. Um, I've uh, heard the introduction to this effort and a mischaracterization of its preparation. This is a 100 percent Syrian initiative that uh, started by and headed and by a number of uh, uh, Syrian uh, opposition figures and Syrians who were not in, in the opposition prior to the beginning of the revolution and decided to take a stance against the regime after it saw its bloodiness and it, how it uh, treated the Syrian people. Mm -hmm. And it's been a work in process for the past uh, at least four months uh, where uh, we uh, attempted to bring everybody together around the, the same table and uh, we uh, worked from the ground, which is the most important element of this coalition and what makes it a different coalition than previous political umbrellas. We worked uh, to build local administrative councils. We wor worked to uh, strengthen these councils and uh, to have these councils to send representatives okay. to but Doha and sit around the table. So yes, that is the most important component of the coalition. Uh, and, well, were there any uh, foreign uh, powers yeah, involved overseeing these, um, these negotiations or was it purely Syrians? It was purely Syrians. Uh, the negotiations, uh, the, the international community, the West in general, the United States, uh, uh, Europe uh, has stated many times that uh, it wanted to see the Syrian opposition united. Uh, the, you know, notwithstanding the, the, the goals and the interest of these powers, the Syrian uh, opposition and the revolutionary forces needed to, to in fact, unite uh, for the sake of the Syrian people, not for the sake of anyone else. Okay. And as such, as such, we, uh, we are receiving uh, positive uh, uh, signals by the international community that, uh, uh, that now, in fact, we can walk in the, in the direction of uh, recognition. And in fact, uh, three countries so far has, have walked in, 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 in these, took these steps, Turkey, Indeed. Italy, and, and France. Indeed. And, okay, uh, okay, yeah, and, so listen, and, thank you for that. Please stay with us. We'll come back to you in a minute. But let me put that to Dan Glazebrook. Um, Dan, was this basically, um, I mean, there have been reports, obviously, of, of, of the involvement of Western countries, of the, the Gulf states, uh, but those are largely denied there, actually. What would you, would you, would you share, Yasser, that this is something that's very needed, given the amount of bloodshed that has been taken, that's indisputable in Syria, that something needs to be done, and this is a way to go forward? Well, I think we should understand this is clearly not representative of the Syrian people. Uh, there was a YouGov poll earlier this year showed 55% of those Syrians who actually live inside Syria um, support President Assad. Um, a general from the Free Syrian Army uh, just about a month ago said the problem they had fighting in Aleppo is 70% of the population of Aleppo supported Assad and always has, had done. Um, the, the Free Syrian Army, the rebels are not supported in Damascus and Aleppo, the main cities where more than half the population of Syria lives. Um, so, so these groups are not represented, even amongst the opposition within Syria. Um, there was huge support for the referendum in February. 89% um, voted yes for a new constitution, and much of the opposition within Syria prefer to take the peaceful uh, road, road to constitutional reform uh, within Syria rather than the Western-backed proxy war um, that's being waged. And I think this new initiative is clearly um, intended by the West to be a fig leaf of legitimacy to give uh, to give a certain amount of legitimacy to the to the all-out aerial blitzkrieg that they are now planning. British, French, Americans are now planning um, against Syria. We saw there's U.S. officials earlier this week have said Patriot missiles are now uh, they're, they're talking about putting some in in Turkey. Um, there's talk there was um, uh, the, the general David Richards, uh, UK general, talked about preparing the RAF for a mission against Syria uh, later this year. He spoke about that a few days ago. And we had on Sunday on the Andrew Marr show, uh, Philip Hammond, UK defence minister, said that he's, his, his department basically been ordered by Cameron um, to find ways to provide some kind of legal justification for a war against Syria. And this I mean, SNI, the, the national that. initiative, is intended is exactly that, a fig leaf to provide some kind of legal framework so they can say, well, these are the representatives of Syria, so therefore it's legal for us to bomb them into power. I mean, Louis Mokdad, I mean, you've, you've heard some of that. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, you have your issues, as it were, within Syria, and, 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 and believe you're, you're fighting
fighting a, a good cause, which is, is one position. But are you worried that you've got Western governments um, posturing as they are now to basically support you, but perhaps not simply support your aims, but to support their aims? Yeah, just uh, let me explain a point. I think your guest said that there's 55 percent from the Syrian people still supporting Assad. Let me explain just this point. I think 55 percent from the Syrian people has been arrested or got one from his their families that has been killed or has been lost to their houses. So how they can support Assad? I don't know about this static and about. I don't know how it's how how they can explain. Which today in Syria we have more than 50,000 persons has been killed by al Assad regime fired. And there's more than five million persons between women and children that have lost their house. And there's more than 800,000 prisoners in Syria. They have been, some of them arrested and, uh, and uh, released again, and some of them are uh, still till now in the Bashar al-Assad jail. So, so I hope that uh, it will be a little fair for these people, for these uh, Syrian people who have been killed since one and, uh, one and a half years since now, and no one talking. About the opposition, I and about the new body of the opposition. As FSA, we are supporting this new body, and we wish them all the luck, and we are supporting them. And let me tell you something. We just finished now uh, uh, one week negotiation and meetings between all the FSA groups on the ground and all FSA councils, the local councils, and the leaders of the FSA. And we just agreed now, uh, 10 minutes ago, we finished our meeting and we agreed a new body who will hold all the Syrian uh, FSA free uh, and the revolutions on the ground. What we want from the new body and the people who represent to be, <laughs> to really represent the Syrian revolution and to really represent the Syrian uh, the FSA and the revolution on the ground and the Syrian people. We don't want to do the same mistakes who have been done by the SNC. The SNC, SNC people and especially the executive office they were not representing us. Most of them, they spend most of their lives outside Syria. They spend around 30 or 35 years outside Syria. How they can belong to the Syrian people, how they can represent the Syrian that's, people. You know, we understand that point, and that's a good one. But what about the question, though, of Western support? I mean, are you, are you worried? I mean, do you think that the West, for example, has a very good track record of its involvement in the Middle East? And uh, why should what's going on now in Syria be any different? No, we need Western help. We need the, all the international community help. We are not worried because we, there is revolutionists on the ground and no one, no one we, we can take our decision anywhere else. We want civil country. We want democratic country. The majority of the Syrian people, they are Muslims, but they are not extremists. We want democratic country, and that's, I think, what the West wants. So now no one can take us to another place. No one can take us to uh, Islamist country or the extremist group. They can't control Syria. And I think we are, we are with the West uh, nations and the international community, we are on the same line. So we are not afraid, and I think the international community should, they, they should take their decisions and they should support us before it's too late. Okay, Louis, Lu stay, Lu stay with us. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Fatah, I mean, um, is it... You know, I think some viewers, of course, here in, in the UK would find it um, a little sort of surprising, given the, the, the Western record in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq. And, and it's been such a change that there is a call from these people here for the United States, for, for Britain to virtually be involved there, when, of course, the history of the last century has been of uh, the colonial powers really causing massive problems. I mean, is, is there an irony there? I think... It's, I mean, if, let us talk, I, I think I have to make a number of points. The first point, I don't think, I think Assad regime lost legitimacy, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And the second point is, no, no one represents the Syrian people, and again, everybody represents the Syrian people, because all the opposition, with all its complexity, they have not been elected. But I think this is a desperate s solution for a desperate situation. We, we are here and we have to solve this problem. I think we mustn't forget, it's not about setting up opposition, it's about stopping the bloodshed, s taking back the country into a stable uh, condition. Well, do you believe we, that the opposition and, and the coalition that's now formed is in a position to do that? I, I, I don't know yet, but I think, I think the Syrian uh, issue needs a solution at three levels, national, regional, and international. And because, okay, the Western power got involved. I don't think that's a very, I mean, it has been demonized. But at the international level, though, okay, it's failed because Russia and China has had, you know, I mean, the Security Council is 
in terms of international law that, that, that was constructed after the Second World War. I mean, it needed the approval of that, any action. I mean, I agree. I agree. Probably there are, even regionally, Iran is not agreeing or, or supporting the initiative. But if, if, it, if the initiative has a Western uh, support, and it depends now, it's very much, as Loi says, it very much depends where they go from here. Are they going to uh, be arrogant and represent themselves as the sole representative of the Syrian people, or they regard themselves as one of the themes that can represent the Syrian people? But uh, uh, somehow, somewhere, the, the Syrian opposition needs to unite with some program, with some agenda. Mm. And, and that, that is very, very difficult because Syria is a totalitarian regime and there, there have never been debates about democracy. There have never been uh, the opposition. How could you, it's very much like situation in Iraq, really. So, mm. you know, groups represent themselves as the representing Syria. And, and there's always problem with that. But okay. if you want to stop the bloodshed, you have to start from somewhere. Maybe that's not a bad, a bad point well, to I start. Mean, yes, uh, Tabara, let's bring in you there. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of groups, and, and of course, you know, George Sabra, uh, a Christian, um, is in the group. Are there any Alawites um, as part of the coalition? Yes, there are. There are uh, the Alawites, uh, the Druze, the Kurds, the Turkmans, the uh, all the sort of uh, representatives from the Syrian tapestry and the mosaic are demographically proportionally represented in the new coalition. But I wanted to address uh, one of the points that uh, your journalist guest made at the beginning. Um, and in fact, his entire theme really surprises me. I have heard that uh, sort of line of narrative about a Western conspiracy uh, using the Syrian people and the revolution. I really thought that we have been over that now uh, almost two years into a regime that uh, has chosen to fly air jets to bombard densely populated areas and commit massacres day in and day out. I mean, uh, just for anyone to even suggest that this regime is uh, legitimate in any way, shape, or form, that uh, anyone who's trying to do anything about uh, uh, helping the Syrian people to remove this regime, uh, uh, to, to, to paint that uh, in a broad, prejudicial brush, uh, brush uh, that, that this is a conspiracy theory and, and that it brings us, uh, bringing us into this uh, 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 international sort of uh, new world order and all this, uh, uh, is, is, to me, is, is I'm, well, I'm sorry, is, is a bunch of hogwash. But okay, yeah, yeah so uh, uh, Dan Glazebrook, I mean, ho hogwash. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, to call it a conspiracy theory is, is bizarre, it seems to me. I mean, the Hillary Clinton, um, David Cameron, they've all been very open that they, that they uh, want rid of Assad, and they've been very open about why as well. They've, they want to attack Iran. Um, they were, they, to really realize to attack Iran, they need to, to, to neutralize Hezbollah. The Israelis tried to neutralize Hezbollah in 2006 and failed. Very soon after that, they came to the conclusion, we need to get uh, rid of Assad. And they decided the way to do this is to fund various jihadi uh, groups to wage a proxy war to do that. Um, they were able to find, they used the Arab Spring as, as cover, if you like, peaceful protests as cover to launch that war. Um, and that's what's going on. I don't say everyone who opposes uh, Assad doesn't have legitimate grievances with the government. Of course they do. Um, I don't say that they're all consciously, you know, w working for, for Western interests or somehow agents. Um, but I do say that they are on the same side as the West and they really need to think and ask themselves, do they really want to be the people who turn Syria into a failed state on behalf of the West, turn Syria into another Iraq, another well, Afghanistan? Just, uh, do they want to be the people who paved the way for Zionist hegemony of the whole region and for the destruction of Iran? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, yes, I mean, the point that I, I suppose I'm trying to get at is that, you know, you're, you're saying to the West now, the West is benign. I mean, I think even you would accept that surely the, the last century the West has been exploiting the region, getting its oil, um, working its own interests, and hardly to the benefit of the region. So why should that suddenly change now? And, and, and now the, the Iranian agenda is the alternative agenda in the region, and now we need to, sub, to, to uh, support the Iranian expansionist agenda in the region and make sure that uh, Iran is empowered and empowering Assad and killing its own population. I mean, what's wrong with this discourse is that it does not provide an alternative. The, the most reasonable alternative, the most realistic workable alternative is for the Syrian opposition to be empowered realistically to, to resist this, uh, this, this oppressing regime. 
the, the West did not take one step towards uh, empowering NATO, for example, or the Security Council in a serious way to, uh, to, to end the bloodshed in Syria. This, if, 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 if the theory of your guess is true, then we would have seen NATO intervention a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago. That is not the case. That is to show you that is, uh, the West has interest. Of course, anybody would be naive to deny that. Mm. But the question is, can we, is there a possible scenario where some of the interests of the West is aligned with the, the aspirations of the Syrian people to get mm. their freedom and to, to protect themselves from the bloodshed and to protect themselves from a madman? Uh, well, exactly. we need to pose that question, and if the answer is yes, we need to accept it. Okay, there well, is a, there is a process. Very quickly, there? There's a yeah. constitutional process in, going on in Syria. There are, the, the Ba'ath Party monopoly on power has been ended now. There, are, there is a reform process going on. There are nine legalized parties operating uh, within Syria. Many of the opposition um, are involved in this, and this is what needs to happen. Okay, well, listen, I want to bring in um, Louay Mokdad very quickly. I mean, Louay, I mean, obviously the resistance has been largely Sunni. We've had such bloodshed in the past, in, in 1982, of course, in Hama. Um, I mean, people are, are, have got, as it, as it were, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of bloodshed on, on both sides. But, I mean, that isn't a recipe for reconciliation. I mean, how do you think you can get the Alawite people over to, to unite in a, in a peaceful country? Let me, be, let me be simple and let me talk as my people inside Syria they are talking. I don't want to get in, in, inside all these complicated cases you are talking about. The, the case is very simple. There is a bloody dictator killing his own people. That's it. And there is a people, uh, there is Syrian people, they want their freedoms. So if we get inside this, all oh, this international map and this international community and what UK wants and what the United States wants, and what, we, we can't find solution. All those countries, they, they didn't support us, they didn't help us, but we didn't stop. And we are continuing our revolution till the end, and we will get this dictator out. This is the Syrian people's decision. It will not change. If they help or they not, we, it will not change. We will get this dictator out of Syria, and we will take, the, take him to the justice, to the court. So now I know there is a lot of blood in Syria, there is a lot of uh, revenge feelings and this stuff. But I know, and I promise, because I know my people, I know the Syrian people. I know that those, those people they are in this uh, land for since 7,000 years ago. They are not, they, they don't came to Syria yesterday. So, I know that after the Sharia Assad, next day we all will forgive each other and we will live again to with each other. Those ethnic, the Dalawi and Durzi and Sunni and Shia, they are not created by the Sharia Assad. They are living in this land since 7,000 years ago. So, we will live again together peacefully okay. because we are peaceful people. We will not okay. fight against each other. That's what I promise and that's what I know. The, Okay, Louie, listen, thank you very much for that. Thank you to all our guests. I'm sorry this could have gone on a lot longer. Uh, but uh, in part two, we've got much more to discuss today. The crisis in Gaza escalates, as many of you know. But now that Hosni Mubarak, famous for hugging Israeli leaders and Sharm el-Sheikh, is gone, and Egypt is run by a Muslim Brotherhood government, will events in Gaza play out any differently than we've seen before? Stay with us.